So it's uh, important to recognize that there is a, a craft, um, some technique to sitting meditation, uh, this particular style of meditation, Vipassana, that we've been working with through the year. Um, offers quite a bit of instruction, actually, about how to work with the body, the heart, and the mind. It's different than other practices, which give little or no instruction. So we always begin with the body. Suzuki Roshi I was fond of saying that the posture is the meditation. So it's important to find a position in which you can be comfortable, yet also alert, a stable, but also um, fluid. Now, if you're sitting on a cushion on the floor, you want to be able to try and have your knees uh, flat on the flat cushion, on the zabutan, and make a sort of stable triangle between the sit bones in your butt and your knees. You can feel a kind of solidity there, sitting like a mountain, really. But if you have to strain in order to do that, uh, there's no point. That's just going to create um, a kind of struggle. So, for example, if your knees don't make it all the way to the ground, that's perfectly okay. You might take um, a small cushion from one of the couches and put them under your knees. It's important that you be uh, relatively comfortable. If you're sitting in a chair, um, sometimes I like to actually sit forward in the chair so I have a feeling of being uh, self-supporting. Or for others, they may want to put a small cushion just between the back of the chair and their, some part of their back so that um, there's a feeling of space, a little bit of space between your back and the back of the chair. and having your feet uh, uh, firmly flat on the ground or on a cushion if the chair is too tall for you. Um, A lot of times, I like to just uh, lean forward and stretch out my back and come back up. And when I do that, when I do that, it forms a very nice... uh, curve in the small of my back. You can feel that there. Just at the sacrum, just above the sacrum. And then you can just kind of follow that line up your spine, allowing each vertebrae to find its place. And the spine extending into the neck and coming up along the back of the head, uh, feeling your top of your head lifting ever so slightly toward the sky. And as you do that, you'll notice that the arch of the back is uh, is, uh, encouraged. And the sternum lifts up uh, ever so slightly in the chest. And then let the shoulders drop. to do with the hands. Mm. I think it's important to experiment and find a place for your hands that feels uh, good to you. Um, Some people like to have them just face down on their thighs or near their knees. Others simply allow them to rest one and the other in their lap. And still others might use a kind of mudra or gesture in which uh, the left hand is placed in the right hand and the thumbs are brought together ever so slightly so that you could slip a piece of paper between the meeting of your thumbs. And there's a kind of egg shape uh, 
to the mudra that's made with the thumbs and the uh, palms of the hand. Now, for me, it doesn't matter if you put your heads on top of your your hands on top of your head. Uh, what's most important is that you know where your hands are. And uh, you continue to sense them. I often uh, rock from side to side um, to feel those sit bones in my butt. Whether you're in a chair or in a cushion, the rocking feels sort of nice. Keeps me from getting too macho about this posture stuff. And then I can tell where I, when I'm, I have my too much pressure on one more than the other, too much on the left or right. And also as I rock back and forth, I can tell whether I'm leaning into the situation or pulling back from it. And what I'm hoping to achieve is a kind of balance, sitting in the right in the middle. So one could uh, give one's whole attention just to the posture, and this would be posture is uh, straight and alert. There's a quality of aliveness in the body. I like uh, to describe the posture as uh, sitting in a way that reflects our self-respect or dignity, uh, being self-supporting and balanced. So the meditation's already begun. And through the course of the sitting, if you need to make an adjustment uh, in the posture, then do that. I try to do it uh, mindfully so that it's not just an automatic movement. You have a clear intention to move, and the movement itself is, is part of the meditation. So we're just sitting here, a skeleton holding us up, muscles draped over the bones, not trying to take a posture, but really discovering the posture, moment to moment. Really reconciling the spectrum between restlessness and constant activity and total stillness. If we look carefully, we will never find total stillness. And then just allowing each of the sense doors to open, uh, sort of consciously, uh, seeing, tasting, smelling, sensing or touching, and hearing. So that the doors of our perception are awake and open. We don't have to be in a rush to meditate. We're not getting anywhere. 
So we can just draw our attention to the experience of hearing. I find this is helpful because hearing, for the most part, takes little or no effort. So we're open and aware of the sounds in the room, the sound of my voice. sounds outside the building. And then there's also the silence. Under all the sounds, embracing the sounds. And if we look carefully, even at the very center of the sounds. So fall back into that silence. Rest in the silence. And see that The silence isn't disturbed by the coming and going of sound. Sound arises and passes away. Silence just remains. Feel the silence. So it's not just an idea. What's its texture? Does it have any edges or boundaries? How far does it extend? And we open the field of our awareness to include the experience of sensation those sensations that seem external to the body and those that seem internal. Places where your body makes contact with the chair or the cushion. The fabric of your clothing against your skin. temperature on your hands and face. And those sensations that seem internal to the body, places of pressure or pulling, Warmth or coolness. The subtler activities of pulsing or tingling. And emerging in these sensations are the sensations of the breath. Not the thought of the breath, but the direct experience. Becoming observant, aware of the breath, and feeling the breath. It's 
rhythm, its temperature, its duration, its texture. becoming aware of where you feel the breath most easily, where it appears most vividly. Perhaps it's in the nose, where the air dances there at the tip of the nose. For others in the chest, the way the ribs lift and separate, or for others it might be at the diaphragm, the way it expands and contracts when the belly empties and fills. Feel it most easily. Let your attention come to rest there. Quite specifically. And then allow yourself to feel and observe the whole length of the inhale and the whole length of the exhale and any pause or gap that may be there as well. The very beginning, the middle and the end of the inhale and the very beginning, middle and end of the exhale Not shaping the breath or managing it in any way, but simply observing and feeling it as it passes over or through that location. Really feeling the rhythm of the breath as it changes. Not observing the breath as if you were looking at it, but living inside the breath. Letting the breath breathe you. And finally, it can be helpful to use a gentle labeling or noting tether the mind to the experience of the body and to help cultivate a moment-to-moment mindfulness. So you might just use the label uh, breathing in or breathing out. Or saying to yourself, breathing in, I know that I'm breathing in. And breathing out, I know that I'm breathing out. Let the label be very soft, not leading the experience, but accompanying the breath. For this morning, giving all of your attention to the experience of breathing in and breathing out, 
And should the mind wander, notice where it's wandered and simply come back to this very precise point where you feel the breath most vividly and let your attention rest there. So we'll take a few minutes uh, each morning for uh, questions or comments or epiphanies. useful to uh, um, deal with the details in the craft. So, maybe you have a question or a comment. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. What you notice? So um, it's a common phenomenon. It happens a lot for people, particularly in the first day or two of a retreat, if we've been really busy. Um, <clears throat> what can help uh, to balance that sleepiness is a couple of things. Um, one, open your eyes if you're really sleepy. Take some intentional breaths to revive yourself. Um, pay more attention to your posture. Those are things that might help. Mm. Not with the idea of trying to get the sleepiness to go away, though. Um, And then there's actually observing the sleepiness. Actually feeling and observing that kind of drifty feeling that's there just before your head nods. And see that you can actually pay attention to that. And actually, as you pay attention to it, it actually brightens the mind. Almost always, um, one of the few times we sit, we're still and we relax is when we're going to sleep. And so there's the kind of habit in the body that when we get quiet and still, we get sleepy. Anything else? Mm, Julie. I used to have muscles in my belly. They could just do that, but they don't seem to work the same way anymore. So, um, I don't think it's, um, I think you have to be careful of the struggle. Um, It's really the spine that does the work, not the muscles. When the spine is really aligned, the skeleton actually holds you up, does most of the holding. We have a tendency to sort of use our muscles to hold us up. So, really let yourself feel the alignment of the spine. I also will say that there's absolutely no great advantage to sitting on a meditation cushion. It's equally fine to sit in a chair. In fact, I'll sit in a chair some of the time during this retreat. Um, this practice comes out of Asia where people sit on the floor a lot. And that's how it got developed. Um, there is a stability to sitting on the floor, but one can have that stability sitting in a chair. So, um, anytime you feel yourself straining, my view, my particular view is relax. And then kind of struggle with the body, really using the muscles to to tense up, try and relax. And you'll find a balance there. I find that when the stability sets in, when the mind becomes more stable, the posture sort of starts taking care of itself. There was a old guy used to sit in and it was Thai, in Thailand I remember in a forest monastery and he sat in an office chair all the time it was this big kind of fat dumpy abbot and he just sat in an office chair with a fan actually all the time and he had the most extraordinary concentration in mind I'd ever seen so
in the first few days of the sitting, uh, it's common for the knots and the tensions of the body just to simply show themselves. In a way, what's happening is we're actually turning toward our bodies and listening in a way that we haven't been before, going so fast, you know. And so, when there's a kind of openness, when there isn't a kind of judgment, what can happen is our body can just show itself to us. It feels kind of free to show itself. And it's going to show itself in its knots and tensions and things like this. It'll show other things too, but first it wants to say, hey, look, these are all the things that have been going on all the last 30 years that you haven't been paying attention to. And so, um, I'd like to talk to you about this. You know? In a way, I think that's what's happening. Anything else? I always want to emphasize um, the joy that comes in the sitting. You know, oftentimes we take it as a kind of somber practice, and I think it's full of joy. It's full of a lot of things. It's also full of suffering and difficulty as well. But uh, I found that um, by emphasizing that quality, what I mean by joy is um, not just lightheartedness, although that's part of it. Joy has about it a quality of curiosity. And um, so when I sit down, I um, sometimes deliberately bring this quality forward, this quality of curiosity. It's a facet of joy, actually. It's interested. It's engaged. It's curious to know what happens next. Often when we sit down, we sit down with a lot of knowing. Oh, I know what this is. This is this back thing. I've always had this back thing. Well, I know about this meditation stuff. And it's a good idea to sit down with curiosity. We'll just see. What will this be like? This next breath. I have no idea. Imagine if you could meet your breath that way. Otherwise, on the other hand, we could just make it a chore. You know? We could make the sitting a chore. We have that choice too. Anything else you want to say or ask? Okay. So every morning we'll give a little instruction, and we'll sit. Instruction will develop and understand that in this meditation we're really opening to a kind of choiceless awareness. However, um, what we found is, is, is that most people, when they just try and open to all that, they kind of get lost. And so it's useful to build some stability first, some capacity to be mindful of our changing experience. And then we can turn that mindfulness like a bright light on whatever other object or field of objects we might be uh, choosing to observe or feel. So that the practice is not about just paying attention to the breath or the body, but opening to the field of emotions and mental states and actually turning the mind on the mind itself and studying the mind itself. But in order to do that, um, we need some stability. And so we cultivate that through the posture, through attending to the breath, bringing the mind home to the breath time and time again when it wanders away until the mind has some capacity for stability. Uh, in this practice, we won't rigidly focus on the breath, but rather, as we open the field, we'll use the breath as a kind of anchor to return to. But also allow our attention to be mindful of the changing experience of uh, body, heart, and mind. Mm -hmm.